This is a project I had the, the very great look of working on. It's the Rocks YHA. It looks kind of, you know, very, you know, you know modern, contemporary, and it is. Um, sometimes you, it's better to be lucky than good when you are a professional, and I was lucky to work on this job, coming in at the right time, in the right company. Um, and actually, I don't know if Abbey Brewer is here, but Abbey Brewer comes from GML, a company in Sydney, and I worked for a short period of time with them, and it was with them that I worked on this project. Um, so it's a youth hostel, looks like any other kind of normal, modern youth hostel. Here's another shot, um, but it's a brilliant location. That's Sydney Harbour Bridge, right there. That's the view from the top. Sydney Opera House and the whole Sydney Harbour. Absolutely amazing. There are five star hotels all around and you can stay in this hostel at a very kind of fair rate and get the same view as millionaires staying in five star hotels. It's booked out years in advance for New Year's. Years in advance. Brilliant spot. But really, I'm going to talk about actually what lies underneath. Well, actually, no longer <coughs> lies underneath. Um, until a few years ago, before the, kind of the site was developed, this is a bad photograph, I know. But it was a car park, before that, a bus park. But really, the, kind of the genesis of the Rocks site, uh, I don't know if any of you have been to kind of the Rocks area in Sydney. Um, the Rocks area was uh, where the, kind of the fringes of society from the first fleet at the end of the 18th century settled. So it was unplanned, it was kind of crazy nooks and crannies, alleyways, laneways, whatever. And now it's like a tourist kind of, you know, uh, hot spot. But it was threatened with destruction in the 60s or 70s. Um, development pressure, level it, build five-star hotels. You can actually see some of the five-star hotels in the skyscrapers behind. And the local working class population directly descended from that kind of early population resisted. And with the unions, one man in the union put up, I think it's called Blackwater, and he stopped work. And the compromise was half the rocks were destroyed and half were retained. But, um, and I'll talk about it briefly later on maybe, right now, because um, money ruins everything in a way, um, the buildings exist, but the people have been pushed out by the state. They own the foreshore authority, the state owns the land, the properties, the leaseholds, and all these different buildings and sites. And they've actually um, pushed out the, the tenants, and they're selling on the leaseholds for 400,000 or 500,000 a pop. They're making hundreds of millions from this site. It was saved by the community, and now the economic return of that location is being utilized by the state. Um, for their own coffers. People are rehoused re elsewhere, but it has destroyed that community. And when I was there in 2014, recently enough, there were still some signs up saying, like, save our community. But anyway, it's pretty much gone now. Um, but as you can see, basically, there's like archaeology everywhere. It's built on two blocks. All right, so it was a car park. It's built on, now it's built on two blocks. This is from the top floor of the, kind of, of the accommodation, uh, one of the accommodation blocks. We look down, you can see all the archaeology. It was, everything was focused on the archaeology. It was kind of almost like a, a shrine. In fairness to the local authority, they wanted to develop this site. It was one of the most important remaining European kind of sites left in Australia. They wanted to develop it. They wanted to develop it, though, in a correct manner to help regenerate this area of the rocks. Unfortunately, the regeneration pushed out the people. Um, so even kind of the services and everything else, is kind of, it's unbuilt on stilts, effectively. <laughs> In the, the mid-90s, most of it was excavated, they called it Big Dig, uh, and then uh, 2008, 2009-ish, um, another excavation was done to enable this development. The research questions were answered, and then the excavation stopped. And 90% of the remaining archaeology was retained. So it was retained by just moving, by just building on stilts effectively. And the archaeologists worked hand-in-hand -hand with the architects to actually say where, where is sensitive, where isn't sensitive. So it was very, very kind of like intuitive and the architects were on site and talking to the archaeologists. It's brilliant. And here again, you can see that's the reception area. That's more of the kind of the built remains. Even the services are, are don't touch, don't go underground. Now it costs a lot of money, but if you look at this way, 36, in 2015, 36,000 people stayed here for two to three nights on average. 
So it's a massive economic benefit to that area of, of Sydney. The why it's in two blocks versus one mega block? Because actually we, re, we re, re, reinstated two of the historic laneways that have been obliterated, quite like what happened in, in London. And then we use these kind of freezes along the kind of the site to actually kind of show the scale of what was there before. Again, you can see how it kind of lifts up over, over the archaeology and the laneway is, is rebuilt again. And interpretation is everywhere. Even the art is based on archaeology. At the top, the view as well, you get to learn more about the heritage of Sydney. But the artifacts aren't necessarily in the museum, they're coffee tables. So you, again, archaeology is everywhere. You're not bringing people to archaeology, you're not bringing people to archaeology, archaeology is everywhere. Even in the, the orientation book when you go in, about how you ring home, there's all this information about the, about the, the rocks. Simple, but cute, but could we do that here? Maybe not. In the education centre, nine and a half thousand people went there in 2015. And I just want, that's all I wanted to say. Pretty much, it costs a lot of money, all right? I can't remember exactly, but somewhere in the range of maybe $20 million, which is far in excess of what it would have been if it was a normal development-led site. But it has helped kind of economically progress that area. It brings people into that area. It's an educational resource for kids. It's a tourism attraction. It's the long-term benefit for Sydney. It's far in excess of that initial economic cost.